off, uh, and it will then be made available in the Covenant of Mayors Library to be watched on demand. Um, those are the key informations I wanted to share with you, and now we can start with the uh, with the content of our of our uh, webinar today. Uh, we will start with a scene setter about perspectives on cities' efforts to tackle CO2 emissions through the electrification of transport. Uh, and there we will have our the project coordinator and policy advisor of EuroCities, Thomas Limes, and uh, Pedro Omen Gouveia, who is coordinator of the safety and security uh, working group at Polis. We will have then a space for some uh, questions that you might want to ask uh, to our to our speakers. That will really be an introduction of the topic. What are the key issues for cities uh, when it comes to the electrification uh, and options that cities have to reduce their emissions through the electrification of the mobility sector? Then we will dive in with presentations from our three speakers on the zero emission zone for freight in 2025 through a local green deal in Rotterdam, the e bus strategy of Barcelona and the presentation of the Stations of the Future Handbook of the Users G uh, project. So thanks a lot already in advance to our speakers for accepting to be with us uh, today. Then my colleague Ariana Merigo will, uh, will ask some questions to our speakers, uh, but there will also be plenty of opportunity for you to ask questions, as I was saying, raising your hand uh, with the raise hand function or writing your questions in the chat. And then we will have some uh, concluding words from Michele Tozzi, who is Deputy Director of k Department of the UATP, which is the International Association of Public Transport. Um, that's our that's what's on the menu for uh, for today. Uh, just before leaving you to uh, to the, uh, the the rest of the webinar, I wanted to give a very uh, short introduction on what is this uh, coalition of the willing on sustainable transport I mentioned uh, just earlier. So in the Covenant of Mayor's Office, uh, we provide capacity building for signatories, uh, coordinators and supporters in the Covenant of Mayor's community. And uh, for us, it's very important that the information is accessible and that cities have, uh, have also the possibility to learn from experts in the sector of, in this case, sustainable transport, organizations that have, uh, that have implemented projects, that have all the knowledge that can support cities in their uh, in their work to becoming climate neutral uh, by 2050 as part of their covenant of mayor's commitments. Uh, so we set up this um, coalition of the willing with different partners that you can see listed here in this slide uh, to, uh, to actually capture uh, information uh, projects, opportunities that are available for cities uh, and to uh, develop this uh, webinar series on different policy options to reduce, em reduce emissions from transport. And we will also develop a structured summary with more information, recording of these webinars, publications that these partners uh, have worked on uh, to share their extensive knowledge with the Covenant community and to have kind of one repository of useful information for Covenant signatories that will be then made available. And transport is quite important in the Covenant of Mayors framework. Uh, you probably all know it because you're working uh, to implement your, your Covenant action plans. Uh, but it is the second uh, most important sector for energy consumption that cities report in this, their baseline emission inventories when they are developing their plans. Those are data from the latest uh, report on energy figures that the JRC just released uh, last month. It's one of the key sectors for mitigation. Uh, together with municipal buildings, tertiary buildings and residential buildings is one of the sectors for climate adaptation. Uh, and there are also a number of indicators on uh, transport that cities can use when they are uh, preparing their um, risk and vulnerability assessments and their adaptation plans. And there are also a number of indicators on energy poverty that can be used by cities uh, to report on the um, on transport poverty in their uh, in their action plans. Um, that's why we came up with this, uh, this webinar series. So here in this slide that you will receive, you will find also the recording of our previous webinars. The first was on public transport, uh, then on urban logistics, on active mobility. And the next one uh, following the, this one on electric mobility will be on SAMS and CCAPS integration in the autumn uh, in September 2023. Um, that was all for me, just to give you a very short introduction of the context in which we are organizing this webinar. And I'm very happy now to pass on the floor to our first uh, speakers today. So first, uh, Thomas Limes uh, and then Pedro Homen Gouveia to give us some perspectives on cities' efforts to tackle CO2 emissions through the electrification of transport from their different uh, points of view. So Thomas, the floor is yours. 
Thank you very much, Eugenia, and good morning to uh, to everyone joining us online. Um, I'd like by I'd like to start by putting things into perspective, um, and I often like to to quote figures. And uh, today I'd like to quote one uh, 500. 500 is actually the number of years we have to go back in time to find a comparable situation to the drought episode we experienced last summer. Uh, unless you live you lived in a cave last summer, uh, most of you have seen already the uh, one of the strong impacts of of climate change. Um, in my actually in my own region, which is one of the wettest region in France, I mean uh, there is a big fire that destroyed a, a lot of hectares uh, of land, and this is actually uh, well actually for cities it's the situation was even worse. Um, and for cities and their inhabitants, uh, what it actually meant for many cities in Europe is that um, they had to set up water use restrictions and they had to distribute water supply also. Um, some of them also had to open up uh, public buildings to allow uh, their citizens actually to to experience a cool a cooler atmosphere. Uh, obviously, heat waves and droughts are only one of the uh, several impacts that cities are, uh, impacts of climate change that uh, cities and their inhabitants experience. Um, but at the same time, it's actually important to yeah to, to mention them um, because at the same time, cities are uh, said to be uh, the major uh, emitters actually of uh, of CO2 emissions. Uh, I think it's around around 70 percent of CO2 emissions uh, are nowadays emitted in cities. But at the same time, they're the place where those effects, uh, though the effects of climate of climate change are also uh, strongly felt. So for cities, actually, there is no option. They have to be at the forefront of the fight against climate change. And they have to uh, to use uh, many levers actually to to curb CO2 emissions that are emitted on their in their territory. So of course, one of those levers is to curb uh, emissions from transport. Uh, a little reminder: uh, transport emissions account on around um, 50, uh, 25 sorry percent of the total volume of CO2 emissions emitted in Europe with actually a major uh, part of those emissions coming from the road transport sector. Um, so there is much to be done there, uh, bearing in, especially bearing in mind that uh, those emissions are still increasing uh, at least until 2025. Um, but at the same time, um, well, when you consider the different situation, uh, today we'll, we'll uh, mostly address one of, uh, of these potential solutions to reduce emission from, from transport. Um, I mean, there is still hope. <laughs> um, when you look at electromobility, actually the picture isn't that grim. Um, in 2023, for instance, uh, EU policymakers actually agreed on a ban on petrol, uh, on the sales of petrol and diesel cars in 2035. Uh, so this will create a uh, an important boost for the supply of electric vehicles in Europe. Um, according again to to assay, when you look at the at the sales figures, according to the uh, European Car Maker Association, uh, on in 2022, uh, around 20% of uh, all the newly registered vehicles were uh, electrically chargeable. So uh, it includes also figures on uh, plug-in hybrid vehicles. Um, in some countries, uh, the sales actually of electric vehicles uh, are now more important than the sales of diesel vehicles. Um, now, when it comes to charging points uh, in the years to come, we will also start to to feel the effect of an important piece of legislation again that was adopted at the EU level uh, that will actually boost the installation of of charging points in Europe, um, allowing them to to be installed uh, where it makes sense and uh, on highways in our streets as well. Um, so there is again hope there um, and. A last one, uh, a last also uh, positive uh, item that I'd like to mention is that in uh, again earlier this year, the European Commission also proposed to uh, to ban the sales of non-zero emission urban buses in Europe in 2030. So soon we'll see also more and more electric vehicle, uh, electric buses actually on on uh, on the streets of uh, our our cities. 
Of course, um, well, electromobility isn't going to uh, isn't the ultimate solution. It's not going to um, to to make a, a big change from one day to another. But this is part of the let's say of the puzzle, uh, part of the all the solutions that cities have um, have at their uh, available solution that cities have to to curb CO2 emissions. Uh, of course, it's not going to solve all our issues of air quality uh, of uh, of congestion, of uh, affordability, also of uh, sustainable mode of transport, but this is part of the part of the solution that uh, local authorities uh, are um, are using, uh, and that they are willing to to support also uh, for many reasons. Um, of course, again, uh, there this transition to electromobility is also going to open the door for many challenges. Uh, for local authorities. One of them, and the first one i like to mention, is the public space. Um, how we will see more and more competition between um, the space that will be dedicated to the installation of charging points. Um, at the same time, we also have a lot of cities now uh, that are on trying to rebalance public space, making more space for active modes of transport, uh, making more space for people to gather and to, well, to in in, in a bit to improve the, the livability in cities. Uh, so how do you make sure that uh, to, to, to strike the right balance actually between those two patterns? Um, how do you make sure that we have the relevant infrastructure? How do you make sure that your grid has enough capacity, for instance, to, to power your e-bus? or to that you have uh, enough capacity in your uh, bus depot. So that's uh, also one of the challenges. Um, how do you make sure also that you optimize the use of electric vehicles so that they actually cater to the needs of different uh, groups of people, businesses, individuals, uh, public transport operators, um, and um, how, so that they can also make the switch uh, little by little to to electromobility. Um, there's also a big issue related to, um, let's say, ensuring that uh, a widespread um, take up of uh, of electromobility in cities, so that um, investments are made uh, throughout the cities and not only uh, where at the places at places where it's the most profitable for for charging point operators for instance um, so there's a, this issue of social justice um, and of course one of them i think it's also not really often under the spotlights is how to use, uh, look at other forms of electromobility not looking at only at cars vans trucks but also at other um, other lighter uh, vehicles such as e-bikes, uh, e-scooters. Uh, we heard a lot about e-scooters recently. Um, so that's a, in yeah in a nutshell uh, the points I would like to to make today because it's yeah electromobility is is one interesting uh, solution, but uh, we have to make sure that to to understand all the issues at stake uh, on, in the in this field. Um, and I think one of the issue, uh, well, Pedro, my colleague Pedro will will also mention uh, some of them. So Pedro, over to you. Merci, Thomas. Uh, good morning to everybody. Thanks for the uh, invitation uh, and congratulations for putting uh, together a very interesting part uh, program. This this is the least interesting presentation of the program. I'll try to do it quick and painless. Um, well. I would like to, to share with you some thoughts about specifically about uh, light electric mobile uh, light electric uh, vehicles. Uh, I'm uh, I'm coordinating a road safety and governance and integration at Polis, and we'll be we've been following and interacting with several uh, of our members, so cities and regions, as a, just as in Eurocities, but also proactively seeking out contacts and, and learning opportunities with uh, many other stakeholders uh, from the industry. And this is a bit of uh, I'd like to kind of share five key points. Number one, the issue that an important part of electromobility uh, policy is, or electromobility developments are happening under the radar of, uh, of, of most of our discussions. When we talk about electromobility policy, we usually tend to think of cars and trucks and public charging infrastructure. 
And we tend to forget the reality of light electric vehicles. So the e-bikes, the e-scooters, the uh, e-skates, the monowheels, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And yet there is a fast growth and diversification um, in that domain. So we are seeing more of these vehicles come into our streets and they're being more and more diverse. Also, we tend to think of when we talk when we think of shared of light electric vehicles, we tend to think of shared uh, mobility fleets. So the e-scooters, the e-bikes that are, you know, these colorful things that are being rented uh, on our streets by several companies. We tend to forget individual ownership. And yet individual ownership of these vehicles is growing very, very fast. Just to give you an example, uh, in 2021 in France, uh, there were in the all street all streets of France combined, there were around thirty five thousand e-scooters belonging to shared uh, micro mobility operators. In that same year, um, um, over nine hundred and eight thousand individual e-scooters. So e-scooters were bought by individuals in France alone. I heard that one hundred fifty thousand of them were sold by Fnac alone. So just to give you an example of the, the reality that is growing right under our radar. The Paris referendum may kick out the shared the e, the shared e-scooters, but it will not prohibit uh, individually owned e-scooters from continue to operate. So the question remains for all cities that even if they do or don't have shared micromobility fleets. A second point is about the electric engines, which I think most of you are familiar with this issue, but nevertheless, it's always important to remind it. Electric engines, they are lighter, they're cheaper, uh, and they are easier to manufacture and install. And so they've, they've been, they're being put into bikes and scooters and kick scooters and skates and monowheels and whatever come next. I've, I've seen some uh, videos of people with is small electric engines in their rollerblade, uh, their low rollerblades. I don't recommend, but well, it's an idea. So all of this and whatever comes next. So uh, what we actually are witnessing is, if I may say, um, a motorization of active mobility. We wanted people to walk and cycle more. And what's actually happening is we are seeing all of these modes being somewhat motorized by electric engines. The active part of this mobility is arguable, but the safety issues uh, remain. We are also seeing, you know, on the other hand, um, the fact that these engines are cheaper and lighter and easier to manufacture and install, this has lowered the barrier to entry in the manufacturing of cars um, into, in the other automotive manufacturing um, industry. So not necessarily to have more companies um, manufacturing cars to sell on the main market to individuals, but to designing and manufacturing cars tailored to the specific needs of new mobility services. For example, car sharing. If you're sharing, if you have a car sharing fleet, you want car sharing that is easy to clean, that is easy to maintain, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So this also raises the question, you know, um, if individually owned uh, light electric vehicles can be charged at home or at the office, we'll talk about that. The point also about electromobility is well, what about how are all these how are these proliferating shared vehicles going to be um, charged? A third point is about the benefits for sustainable mobility. We tend to focus on the negative impacts of e-scooters uh, being left around in the in the in the sidewalks, and that's a big problem. But um, the fact we also think to need to think about the benefits um, and. Uh, the fact is, to dispense with private car ownership, people need an alternative, um, a diversified menu uh, of alternatives. The more diversified this menu of alternatives, the more versatile it will be as a whole. And the more versatile it is, I mean, capable of accommodating diverse needs of different people, the more reliable it will be. And so the more appealing and attractive it will be for people who today own a car. Shared micromobility enriches this menu of alternatives, and that is a fact. Um, it also enables uh, new mobility consumers, meaning the people who are turning 18 and becoming adults, which we can have um, a choice about their mobility options. Well, it enables these new mobility consumers to start on the right foot. 
Uh, I remember many years ago, um, many, 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 many in the galaxy far away, when I was, when I turned 18, you know, this rite of passage into adulthood was getting a car license and driving the family's car. This, uh, not necessarily anymore, also because of shared micromobility. And finally, uh, individual e-scooters are cheaper and smaller than electric bikes. So they are within reach of people who cannot afford an electric bike or who don't have the space to keep an electric bike in the common areas of the building. If you buy, if you buy a 1500 euro electric bike, you're certainly not gonna leave it outside of your house in the night. But if you have a small house, you're not gonna keep it inside your house as well. So an e-scooter uh, kind of um, solves this problem. So there's a social dimension to consider uh, as well. And plus, you know, these individual um, e-scooters, they account for longer trips. So that's another interesting point to consider. The fourth point is about safety uh, in two aspects, road safety and fire safety. So road safety, uh, specifically uh, sidewalk safety, if we look at it, there are two points to consider. One of them is the chaotic, chaotic parking of shared e-scooters on sidewalks. But we have to understand that there is hardly any alternative being provided by uh, many cities. Individual cars still monopolize uh, on-street parking uh, in many cities. And on the other hand, riding on sidewalks and the fear that that instills in elderly people, people with um, uh, visual disabilities, etc. Well, the fact we have to understand that e people who are riding e-scooters on the sidewalk are doing it because they're afraid of riding it on the carriageway. They don't want to share space with the cars. Understandably, you know, it's more it's because in many places cars are very very dangerous and there are no speed limits no proper speed limits no proper conditions to share the space with cars and yet if we want to worry about the falls and all the uh, damage that can that, that that can do the asphalt is the safest surface to ride an e-scooter so here we have to decide if we're going to deal with the symptoms or if we are actually going to deal with the causes and so to deal with the causes we need to upscale to really grow the number and the distribution of dedicated parking and we need to lower speed limits in our cities in terms of fire safety the question is um, particularly inside um, the home because batteries of e-scooters are not the same as the batteries of smartphones um, number one they are multi-cell so they are more vulnerable to damage uh, number two, they are subject to changes in temperature, vibration, shock, you know, they go around vibrating on the on the cobblestones. Uh, we don't have the same, we're not as careful as with these batteries as we are with the battery of our smartphone. We keep it in our pocket. It's not exposed to, to big changes in temperature, etc. Then, but they are also bigger, which means that the fire and smoke that they will expel in case of fire are exponentially bigger not by if you know it the uh, uh, one of these batteries can be 10 times bigger than the battery of your smartphone but it will expel 100 times as much smoke if it catches smoke and it's highly toxic smoke it comes out a lot and very very fast if you're sleeping uh, you're likely to become unconscious in 10 seconds and you won't even notice it so if i may give you this advice never ever charge your bike or e-scooter battery in your house and especially in your room at night. You can charge it in your house while you're awake. Never do it while you're sleeping. Which leads us to the final point, which is about um, charging um, infrastructure. And here, um, the challenges posed by um, light electric vehicles are basically twofold. What about charging infrastructure in the public space? What about charging infrastructure inside building, particularly residential buildings? In terms of public space, we have to consider that there's a growing resource to um, swappable batteries. They make everything more convenient for everybody. So you don't have to actually move the vehicle to charge it, you can just swap the battery. You can carry, um, if you're doing deliveries, for example, you can carry replacement batteries, um, if you're doing, if you're operating a shared micromobility fleet, we can simply bring uh, uh, batteries to change. Um, another point on public space is that, you know, things have to go together, parking and charging. And e-hubs are a particularly interesting solution for that. And finally, um, when you think about park parking and charging, we must consider that it should be these 
e-hubs and they should be multimodal. So not the not just everywhere parking for e-scooters, but for e-scooters, for uh, e-bikes, for delivery bikes, for um, shared cars, uh, for shared scooters, etc. And trying to articulate as much as possible with public transport, particularly bus and subway stops and stations. And a final point is about uh, charging infrastructure in buildings, uh, particularly residential buildings, uh, but not only. We are think we've been thinking a lot about um, making sure that people can charge their cars uh, in in the buildings where they live. But we definitely need safe conditions for charging uh, light electric vehicle batteries in residential buildings, particularly uh, in common spaces. This is not technically difficult. The solution is there. There are something as simple as a charging lockers, which are fireproof. Um, and so you can basically put your battery charging there. I mean, like they use these fire, uh, fireproof charging lockers in big events. Uh, there's one, if you're curious, in uh, in the Brussels Central train station. And we need to um, get this going because otherwise um, we will see more and more um, fires uh, happening, which, which are particularly uh, lethal. And with this nice thought, I end my I end setting the scene. You were expecting something more dramatic, perhaps, no? No, but it's, I mean, yeah, we need to be also aware <laughs> of all the risks. <laughs> Thank you very much for uh, to you and Thomas for, uh, yeah, for this very comprehensive introduction uh, to the topic. I think there is a lot of food for thoughts and a lot of actually the, um, the challenges that you mentioned, I think that will come in the presentations uh, uh, that we are hearing next. Um, I would invite participants if you want to raise your hand. I don't see any questions in the chat, so if you have a question, um, just let us know. Otherwise, I, I would have actually a very quick question to, to both of you just before we move to the next block. Uh, because in the Covenant of Mayors, last year actually has been uh, really focused on the energy crisis for Covenant signatories uh, as well. Cities have been implementing a lot of measures uh to to shield citizens from the effects of the energy crisis and to uh to both actually act in the short term but also then foresee investments and plans for uh for increasing their the resilience to those kind of shocks in the in the long term and it also had an impact actually on transport poverty last winter uh, and we know that transport poverty is an emergent concern in many cities so my question just if you could uh, just give like a uh, one piece of advice to cities uh, in this field. Do you think micromobility micro and electromobility can also support access to transport? And are there opportunities for cities to also improve access to transport, transport and reduce transport poverty thanks to, um, to the electrification uh, of, of mobility in their, in their context? Not just public transport, of course, but also micromobility, as we were saying, and, and active mobility. I don't know, Peter, do you want to start? Or, yeah. Okay, <laughs> should I start? <laughs> or thanks. Um, I think it's, again, part of the potential solution to address uh, transport poverty, but especially, I would say, when it comes to electromobility, especially when you think about our shared models of transport uh, also. Um, I mean, let alone uh, lighter, uh, lighter electric mode of transport, but when you think about um, the affordability of an electric car today, I mean, it's, let's be honest, it's still um, far from the budget of uh, of many people. Uh, and the and the second hand uh, market of electric vehicle is still really uh, to to take up. Um, so I think it can be an interesting alternative to for people to, well, to, to use those mode of transport. Um, and uh, there are also interesting developments uh, in the field of electromobility, um, especially regarding smart charging, for instance, or by what we call bi-directional charging, um, allowing actually the, the users to, to charge their, uh, well, to limit actually the pressure uh, of, uh, of electric, electromobility, of, of EV charging on the grid. And in some situation, it can you can also uh, well, reduce the bill, the, the charging bill actually of your electric vehicles. So there are interesting solutions, but they have to be uh, part of of something else. I would say electromobility alone per se isn't going to make a lot of difference for for a lot of people. Yeah. Well. Um... 
two, for, you know, three very brief points. Number one, um, so electromobility relies on electricity, right? Uh, and we tend to think that uh, electric energy will abound and will be cheap and free for all or will, will we be in, with very low prices. If you look at the structural elements going forward, that's not necessarily going to be the case. Uh, we are seeing a fast growth of digitalization and of the digital infrastructure, and now even more with uh, AI systems. And we know these uh, systems consume, consume, consume massive, massive amounts of electricity for the running of the systems, for the cooling of the systems, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. They consume massive amounts of electricity and they are going to be competing with the electricity, so they will be an important part of the demand for electricity. So that will surely keep prices, I mean, not low. Uh, then there's the aspect of uh, resilience of the electric. I mean, every time we talk, uh, there's a very big difference between uh, providing gasoline, diesel, etc., where basically to provide this energy to vehicles, you need, well, refineries, uh, you leave extraction, transport, refineries, and transport to a network of stations. With uh, electricity, you need a continuous network of millions and millions and millions of kilometers of well, wires and cables, right? And of course, uh, with uh, extreme climate events, um, which will have an impact in all sorts of infrastructure, there is a question to consider about the resilience that we can expect of, the, of this infrastructure not only the possibility of damage to it, and so of cutting of, of supply, but also the capacity that our local public authorities will have to be proactive and fix this infrastructure in time. If there's no money to fix everything, then they will fix some parts and later or never other parts. So there's, there's this two very practical um, aspects. If we think about mobility in particular, uh, I mean, the key thing uh, is to uh, think about suburban areas. I mean, uh, the uh, definitely access to public transport, one thing, uh, but also as in some cities already, this is being done an alternative to public transport. I mean, when there's a strike, but also when there's overcrowding um, in, for example, subways. And finally, uh, as an alternative to court, to public transport. You know, there is a problem in thinking that uh, micromobility is the first last mile solution. I mean, if you have an electric bike, uh, you can easily do 15 kilometers or more huh? uh, and, on your commute. So actually thinking of a first last mile is quite limitative. Um, and what we need is to really enable this uh, longer trips in these, if we think about light electric vehicles, is to really enable and encourage uh, longer trips beyond the, the, the mile, certainly. So yes, there's a, obviously there's a, a critical opportunity here to um, increase um, transport justice. Thank you very much to both of you. Um... And I will now, yeah, thank you again for, for being with us, for sharing all those thoughts. Uh, if participants, you have questions that come also later, you can ask them in the chat and we will ask uh, to my impeder if they're so kind to answer them also in the chat. And we will now move on to the next uh, block of this webinar, where I will hand over the floor to my colleague, Arianna. Thank you, Eugenia, and thanks to uh, our colleagues that set the scene beforehand. I would uh, now invite uh, our three speakers for uh, the, the next slot of this webinar to turn on their camera. So, uh, Jost Rang from the city of Rotterdam, uh, Josep uh, Armen Gold from uh, TMB Barcelona, and Juan Jimenez uh, from uh, um, the Instituto de Biomecanica in Valencia. So I can see you all on the screen. Uh, thank you very much for being with us today. And um, I believe we will uh, start with you, uh, Jos, and that ah, we have the presentation integrated. Great. Um, that's great. So Jos, I would uh, please tell us a bit more about how you have been working on city logistic. Yes, well, uh, thank you for this opportunity. And of course, already a lot of complicated matters have been raised by the scene setters, and I think I'm going to add a few more, but then at a, let's say, the more local level of the uh, city of Rotterdam in the Netherlands. Uh, 
well, please skip to the next slide because I have quite some and limited time. Uh, so I'll. So uh, to set the scene uh, at local level, we have a, a sustainable urban traffic plan with three principles, which are, I think, familiar. We have laid them down in documents, translated into English for those participants interested. They can contact me and I can provide them with, uh, uh, with the links. Next one, please. Um, <clears throat> well, this is perhaps also a familiar principle. Um, our mobility approach is about inverting this pyramid, pyramid huh? uh, rebuilding Rotterdam after the Second World War. You, many of you know, I think, that the, the city center was uh, heavily bombed uh, in the war and rebuilt more or less American style. So uh, maximum uh, uh, accessibility for cars. We're trying to reach that. Please click the button. And then you see where we are trying to go. So the active mobility modes, the healthy modes as well, uh, uh, get priority. And at the bottom of the pyramid, we see motorized vehicles. And Pedro also raised, of course, in this priority uh, sequence is also the shared mobility. But it doesn't help, of course, if the shared vehicles uh, don't replace individually owned vehicles, but just add on to them, because then we have even more um, space problem. So next one, please. And then the next level we need, please click the next one, would be for me, because I'm a freight uh, transport uh, policy advisor, to integrate also the freight vehicles into this pyramid. And you can see that the car, actually the passenger car, is at the very bottom of the pyramid. And from our policy point of view, we think city logistics, so making sure that goods get into the city, waste gets out, um, that is uh, to be prioritized more. And of course, we need all those vehicles to have the least environmental impact, so they need to be zero emission. Next one, please. This is an impression of, sorry, can you go back to one, of our uh, town hall and the city in front of it, the call signal. Uh, and it, it shows that, that pedestrians and cyclists and public transport uh, are the main occupants of the public space in the street. And only to the left, we have only two lanes, which used to be four. So it was quite a transition. And we're quite happy, of course, with having a, a real example already working now. Although I must say there are new uh, traffic safety issues because a lot of very fast bikes, e-bikes, uh, ride on this uh, double uh, lane uh, bicycle path. And as a pedestrian, when you cross, you really need to be aware of what is coming towards you at very high speed. So that's one of the new issues. Next one, please. Um, well, <clears throat> regarding to our policy, we have some points we'd like to share with you. Uh, of course, the presentation will be shared, so don't worry if it's uh, going too fast. Uh, but we think the policy should be specific and concrete, preferably in numbers. It's a bit of a technocratic approach, but very often we get <clears throat> the request from people involved, from stakeholders, so to speak, that they need to be uh, to form an image of what is, what is our intention, where do we need to go with the city? And then we, we want to be very specific, if possible. And it should be achievable, achievable, of course, for the stakeholders. And then we mean the whole logistic chain. Huh? So shippers, transporters and receivers, not only companies, also consumers, because we are all receivers of goods. We order them, we pick them up, perhaps, or have them delivered to our door. So our behavior is also part of the policy. And there are three um, principles, so minimum environmental impact, maximum efficiency, also use of energy. So I very much agree with Pedro when he says it's not uh, 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 all that evident that energy is going to be abundant or very cheap. So efficiency also pertains to uh, um, energy and urban space, of course, because of growing urban density is going to be more scarce. So we need to make sure from the public interest point of view that this is used very well in the public space. Um, and then, of course, if you regulate something, if you tell your citizens and your companies within your city boundaries to do something or to leave it, uh, then you need their commitment. So you have to explain what's the reason and to try and get them along with you. Next one. Uh, here are some 
principles. The sharing is important. You see a shared uh, e-scooter there. Well, scooter, that's of course an ambiguous term, but you know that moped, I think I should say. Um, for logistics, it's of course more about sharing fleets, uh, sharing uh, commercial space for uh, um, bundling, uh, consolidation of goods. Um, and you see some other things like priorities. These are always, uh, the privileges are always temporary. Here you see an electric truck using a bus lane, top right. But if all trucks become electric and they all are going to use the bus lane, then of course public transport is going to be in trouble. So this is a temporary measure to stimulate uh, and make visible, hey, if you do this, then you're doing the right thing. Leading by example is the other thing. We have our own fleet of garbage collection uh, vehicles and the heavy ones which are hard to electrify. We have still uh, managed and I thought it's important to set the example. So you see here a golden truck which is zero emission and collecting the domestic uh, waste. Thank you. Next one. So this is uh, the, the framework document. Please skip to the next one. It's available in English. This is the zone we're intending to introduce in 2025. Is going to be decided this year, uh, so the regulation. Uh, it's about 40 square kilometers encircled by the, the ring of national highways uh, surrounding the city. Next one, please. We have an access regime, so that's of course uh, quite important. It's very specific. What kind of vehicle gets access until what date? So we start on uh, 1st of January 2025, but you can see that there's a, a transition period for different uh, types of vehicles. So the clean vans, diesel vans can uh, stay on a little longer, allowing for the companies to adapt their operations. Next one, please. And then uh, we have nine solutions. They are in the policy documents. I'll not go into them too far. I think they're also quite well known. And we apply them to six uh, distinguished uh, categories. Uh, and some may be viable for for one uh, segment, some measures or some solutions and some for the others. And we're always open, of course, to new developments, development ideas. Next one, please. And of course, we want our policy to be successful and then we have to know when 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 is it successful? Of course, that is the percentage of uh, vehicles uh, carrying out the, the, the city logistics. They need to become zero emission. Uh, we have a starting point 2025. Huh? It should be ready for the vans, the light vans. I think we're going to achieve that. But then the heavier the vehicle get, the more difficult it becomes. And by 2030, for all heavy trucks and trailers to be fully electric is really a challenge. So we're now also working with the national government for uh, an exemption scheme. So if it if your vehicle needs replacement because it's Euro 4, for instance, and there is not yet a zero emission um, version available, then of course we need to arrange that you can buy a Euro 6 or the best possible solution. If you cannot change your operations, of course that is. Um, and then uh, make sure if you're an entrepreneur that you make your investment not in vain. Uh, so if, if the, the period of write-off is longer than 2030, you need some sort of guarantee. That's the kind of very practical problem we're trying to solve with the government. How are we going to regulate this? Next one. Then we have three key elements. Next one, please. The first is about space. Here you see an impression. I think any city can uh, provide such, come up with such a picture. I'd like to point out the, the yellow uh, sign in the middle because it's there because of road maintenance works. And this means that the very limited space in the city is more or less structurally unavailable for a part because of maintenance. We have to replace uh, sewerage or, or uh, pavement or lining. Um, and we're actually challenging now in, in some calls of European institutions to come up with a solution that can bundle forces because temporary but long term uh, infrastructural maintenance uh, induces and makes necessary behavioral change and we can see we want to try and see if this change can be can help uh, make the transition for the logistic operators to change their behavior both receivers transporters and uh, and shippers um, 
So if we have less accessibility because of, uh, let's say, an intersection, largely intersection, we need to be overhauled, then perhaps the contractor carrying it out can cooperate with the logistic service provider to make sure that the shops that are hindered for their uh, delivery can be still be uh, 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 receive their goods and send their goods, and perhaps that behavioral change can be uh, can remain after the works have been finished. Next one, please. Uh, here are some uh, items we're trying to improve in the way we operate. So we, it's, it's a many layered uh, uh, work. Um, I think I'll leave it here. The last point perhaps is interesting um, that we're preparing now uh, uh, an experiment of priority for e-trucks. Um, of course, we realize at least I think that's one of the problems I've brought up. I think you can prioritize trucks but e-trucks and not uh, diesel trucks is really a hard problem at traffic lights of course and you're not going to say okay only this truck can pass and then i put it on red again but still the efficiency of the freight traffic can be greatly enhanced i think by this type of measure and of course um, efficiency and zero emission uh, is, is is going hand in hand in many cases next one please so we have some R&D topics, my personal uh, hobby horse, you could say, is the, the simulation of freight transport. We should have a, a, a tool which is as, uh, let's say, sophisticated as the simulation of passenger traffic, because freight traffic is becoming more and more important. And we're a long way, but we need a few more years and projects, I think, to get uh, to where we need to be. Um, the third point, perhaps, is interesting to point out as well, so far, I think our, well, not our blind spot, but at least our weak spot has been that we have no really coherent idea, and also not a policy um, regarding the demand management. So how can we change our behavior as consumers, also as receiving businesses, for instance, cooperating in receiving goods so that we can make the delivery uh, trips more efficient. Uh, so we're really looking to, uh, to improve that, to develop something, and we're also cooperating with knowledge institutes and, and educational institutes to, to achieve that. And it's been mentioned, so I'll not go into it more deeply, but we're really also uh, worried and, and researching how to make sure that the energy is not going to be the limiting factor. Next one. Um, we are making sure in spatial planning policy, long-term planning policy, that room for logistic spaces, primarily now at the edges of the city, for consolidation purposes uh, are sufficiently available and micro hubs within the city center are you could say the next level more detailed that's that's another complementary element next one please the second pillar is community building so engaging the stakeholders next one please so we have a, a community called logistic 19 which organizes events which has a website where knowledge is exchanged and which uh, issues a newsletter to point out interesting and relevant events. Next one, please. Um, so here you, yeah, that's OK. Uh, so we involve stakeholders in policy development. That's really an important function of this community. We have recently installed the City Logistics Advisory Board, the covenant partners for our uh, zero emissions zero city logistics zone covenant are uh, a member of this board and it's giving uh, unsolicited and requested advice to the well, both to the civil servants and to the uh, the governors uh, regarding city logistic matters so issues which are important for them to make the required transition um, and of course share experience between larger cities with the national government to help develop realistic policies and developing pilots uh, for instance, oh, that's the second one. I uh, <clears throat> actually I intended to say they are sharing experience internationally, such as this meeting, as in this meeting. Next one, please. And then finally, there's the personal approach. We need to really get down into detail. We think. Next one, please. We have an EcoStars program. Uh, we help the stakeholders cope. Uh, this EcoStars program, as a company, you can get a uh, a free advice. Uh, so you make uh, an appointment and then um, 
the, the so-called uh, logistic brokers, they, they tell uh, the companies, this is going to happen. What does it mean for your company? Uh, what should you do? What can you do? How can you help? And um, it involves all these points here. Very important and interesting point is a free tryout of electric vehicles or alternatives for the current way of operation. And it, it's quite uh, well met, uh, we're glad to say. Next one. And we're actually doing two things, stimulating front runners, but also informing the laggards to make sure that everyone is informed and whoever wants help can get it. Um, so we're sending a lot of letters, but to give you an impression, we send out 10,000 letters to uh, more than 10,000 letters to all van owners registered in Rotterdam and uh, informing them. And only I think we got some a little more than 100 replies. So that's really a very minimal response. Uh, we repeat it uh, and we're trying to find out next way. So any suggestions uh, in this audience will be welcomed as well, of course, especially the small companies that have only one van and are very busy going about their business. They're really hard to, uh, to reach. Next one. And that's the last one. Uh, I'd like to <laughs> end up with a, some sort of positive uh, message. So we're trying to make it happen and uh, we need to share also internationally, uh, share our experience and uh, not only of course the successes, also the, the negative experience, actually those are even more important I think than, uh, than the, of course you should be proud of what you've achieved, but the things making it difficult are more important for the others and not to make the same mistake. Thank you for your attention. Any questions I'd be happy to ask either now or at the end of this uh, blog. Thanks a lot, Jos. Um, very impressive developments. And uh, I noted down a few questions for the discussion uh, after the, the panel. So I don't see any uh, immediate question in the chat. So I would uh, move on to our uh, next speaker. So we now travel to Spain uh, with uh, Josep that uh, will tell us more about their IDBAS uh, strategy. Hello, good morning. Thank you for the invitations in this decarbonization time. Um, I'm working in PMB, uh, and my idea in this presentation is uh, to show how we are adapting uh, to these uh, new technologies to be cleaner. Uh, and this very nice time that we are changing everything. Um, the control okay okay um this is our general features mm, we are quite close to the demand before the pandemic um and the, the most important uh um, data features in this slide is we have a fleet of 100 buses and the commercial speed is 12 kilometers going down because every, every day there is more people on the streets and and this uh kilometer this uh, commercial speed is is every, every day worse um we are in a new, a new, a new in a new network uh we changed from the classical network to orthogonal network and now we have quite experienced nowadays is more than eight years working when when we start we start very slowly and and today uh, this is a good example for to increase our demand what is our plan this is our general plan uh, from 21 to 24 this is where we uh, where we have a concrete uh, investments Okay, it's not a gen it's not a general plan. This is a concrete investment. Then you will see the what is our our dream. Um, we are going to increase our electric fleet to 232 in 24. Uh, and uh, another another technology, another clean technology is the hydrogen technology. We are increasing, and in 2024 we'll have 44 buses. Uh, we are now in the in the second tender, and we are decreasing the hybrid uh, diesel buses and of course the diesel buses, 
and we and the idea uh, today today we don't know what will happen in 2024 after 2024 uh, the CNG technology will we will keep uh, the the size of of the of our fleet why because uh, CNG is uh, not absolutely clean technology if we use uh, uh, biodiesel uh, technology that we don't have in Spain. Uh, there are a lot of uh, companies, industry, uh, trying to transform their the, uh, industry with, uh, with, this, with biodiesel because CNG is uh, in Spain uh, almost is uh, 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 dirty technology. Okay, it's not clean. In Europe, yes, but not in Spain. Um, we are working in all these technologies. This graph, uh, the, the small graph down, uh, is the directive from the Commission, the European Commission, talking that the, the CNG is, is is clean, but not not in Spain. Um, what we are doing with electric buses, okay? In 2024, in 2024, we will have 200 uh, electric buses. But nowadays, uh, more uh, 59 buses are uh, articulated, and they are working in uh, in in the technology of opportunity charging. They are charging in the in the terminals of the city. Okay, this means that we have to install a charger, a chargers on the on the terminals. In this case, it's two chargers in in both terminals. Now we will have three electric uh, electric opportunity charging lines uh, in Barcelona. The rest of the lines, uh, the rest of the buses, to 232, uh, will be override buses. Um, the question is, is this technology absolutely clean? Because we are going to be cleaner, but to be efficient. Uh, there, there is uh, some technical questions in this slide, but uh, as, as my colleague from the Rotterdam, they have in this graph, the, the small graph that uh, shows that in summer we have 30% of the and the consumption more than in winter, in, in, I think in Rotterdam probably is is, is the opposite. Uh, the problem is that with the technology, the, the the energy that the manufacturers put on the bus is not enough uh, to be operating the the time that we need uh, every day. Okay, that this means that. What we don't know what we will do in the end of the batteries because the batteries uh, they have uh, depreciation uh, degradation of the uh, of the uh, of the capacity capacity. What we are doing uh, to be uh, adaptable uh, for our fleet, okay, it's not the big fleet, but this one thousand uh, buses. Uh, our idea is to work with another technology that is quite new, but uh, it's quite mature. Uh, it's, it's not, we start uh, more than 10 years ago with 3,000 buses. What we have now, we have now eight buses that they are running since January. Uh, in this public uh, infrastructure, this is public because uh, the, we, have, we, we, we send lunch to tender for uh, space. And, and the manufacturers of, of, offer uh, to install their, their manufacturer, and we pay the, the cost of the of the of the favors. Um, the idea is to increase. Now we are in tender for uh, more more hydrogen buses. What in general? What is our acquisitions in that in this period of 21 to 24? Uh, half of the fleet will be electric, and the rest, uh, important fleet has been uh, CNG. And we don't know what we will do after after 2024 because we have the idea was where to uh, to buy uh, hydrogen CNG buses, but we don't know what we is not decided. Nowadays, and we will try to uh, buy hydrogen buses. 
this is our dream. Okay, uh, we know very well what we will do after uh, um, until 2024, but the rest is 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 we, we don't know exactly what we are doing because there is a lot of uh, well, for example, in, in Spain, we are, in Barcelona, we are uh, constructing a new uh, depot, uh, and this means a lot of uh, a lot of uh, problems and nightmares. And this is uh, an important graph uh, to compare the different technologies. Okay, this is not general; it's absolutely applied to uh, Barcelona uh, to know what is cheap and what is not cheap. Uh, if we compare uh, different technologies, we can see that the electric and hydrogen. Uh, in spite that uh, hydrogen is the the the, the bus costs more more than electric bus. Um, the, the the energy you compare the energy you compare the the maintenance uh, more or less the, the the price is more or less the same if you compare during the 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 15 years uh, operating uh, why the CNG is too expensive because the price of the of the the energy the price of the energy today is very very expensive okay. We don't know what will happen when this CNG uh, transform to bio, bio, biogas, biomethane. Uh, we don't know. Thank you. This is what we are doing, where we are enjoying this nice time for discarbonizing. And if you have uh, questions, I'm available for you. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Josef, uh, and congratulations for the progress that you are making in Barcelona when it comes not just to a bus, but uh, the overall mobility of the city. Um, I would uh, move to our uh, next speaker so that we can uh, have a bit of time for the, the questions at the end. Uh, encouraging again uh, participants to to write them in the chat or note them down and raise your hand uh, towards the end of this webinar. Um, Juan, I would uh, give the floor to you uh, and let's travel to the future with uh, user Chi. Okay, thank you very much and thanks for the invitation to, to present here this uh, project, this user Chi is a uh, uh, Horizon 2020 project granted by European Union uh, and uh, with the aim of uh, deploying the potential of the uh, uh, electric vehicle in, in Europe. So with this with this idea, okay, how I, okay, I have to press. With this idea, the from a user-centric approach, the project is trying to develop different products to uh, to foster the, the electromobility from uh, new ways of, of changing the, uh, the vehicles, uh, new platforms to, to make it easier, to define these uh, stations of the future, how these uh, stations will be in the future. So to do it, uh, we uh, what we made were a, a user research, including a qualitative research, trying to find out which are the problems, which are the, the strengths and which are the weaknesses that have today the, the charging process of, of the electric vehicles. We, we have also a quantitative uh, research, a big survey in six different countries and uh, a co-creation in order to define the products. So in the context uh, of this co-creation, uh, we plan the development or, or the, um, the first proposal of this station of the future. Uh, from the, the, our user research, we uh, mm, uh, we get a lot of information about the problems that uh, the users were having for charging the, their cars. But we also uh, asked directly how they were thinking that we're going, we're going to be this, this station of the future. If you see, for example, the results from the survey, uh, uh, we, we in, in Science Square, at the last place we see that they say the increase of, of the charging points uh, locations, but they are, are also are talking about different aspects of, of the charging uh, process, as, like, like is the, the the possibility of of booking or interoperability or or making easier the process of identifying the car. So we will see here that quantity is important, but is not the most important, perhaps. Or there are another qualitative aspects that are, are that are also very important. So. With the information we got, uh, we defined uh, uh, how we're going this uh, we're going to be this uh, future 
of this station of the future, uh, thinking in an intermodal stations, spaces integrated in nature, uh, where charging different technologies, uh, secure technologies, uh, flexible. So this was uh, doing this. We, we in this co-creation workshop, we planned uh, our first sketch. We could say that should be intermodal, sustainable. And this is what we made about uh, our first uh, charging station of the future being uh, intermodal station. So we assessed this intermodal station uh, and we see that, for example, no logistic was considered here. The, uh, we have to uh, also that this was not, this was not a solution for, for city centers. So we need something more for the city center because it was very, uh, we need very, uh, a lot of space, a lot of ground uh, to, uh, to, to, to install this facility. We also uh, had another product that was the, uh, a solar charging station for light electric vehicles in our, uh, in our project. So we made the same. We planned, uh, we planned to, to develop in a creation workshop uh, uh, a station of these characteristics. Uh, we made it very short. So we made this box with this roof for, uh, for locating the, or for placing the, or installing the, the uh, photovoltaic uh, panels. But also the idea of taking benefit of the of the urban furniture to install these photovoltaic panels. We again assess uh, this this fair result with in, in our consortium. And for example, yeah, it was not very attractive from the point of view of the design. So we should we should make something more attractive. Also, mod modularity was important because probably it was uh, it was more efficient to design. Um, uh, a simple a station that could be modular, so you could add different modules in order to to increase the the, the capacity. So we did finally we defined uh, four uh, different stations. One uh, was this multimodal station. We also uh, had to define an urban station, considering that uh, we should include in this urban station logistics and and also uh, taking in consideration that not so much place. Uh, could be uh, used to, to install this station. Uh, in our project, we, we should think also in solutions for, uh, for the highway, for the long trips, and, and also solutions for light electric vehicles, uh, considering that we have this technology of, of trying to develop uh, electric chargers uh, or solar electric uh, uh, chargers. So this is... Uh, uh, I am going to present now uh, the content of the uh, of the handbook that you can download from from our website. So um, uh, I wanted to give you before a, a view of the background, how we have reached this uh, this solution, uh, and th this is the introduction of the of the handbook. We we are trying to present here also the the stages of the future. Uh, and uh, we are combining here like an introduction what I was saying before. Uh, it's important because we were comparing the number of churches that we have in, in for example, in, in Norway, that is the, probably the most developed market in the electric vehicle, comparing with the quantity of churches that we have in Germany or in Spain. Uh, yeah, they have uh, a higher quantity of churches. But uh, users were saying that other things are important when, when you are uh, charging your electric vehicle. Uh, mostly, for example, that you can easily uh, can book uh, uh, a charger and, and you are sure that when you arrive uh, you, you will have access to this charger and you will you will find an, uh, another vehicle park or uh, you won't, uh, you won't find there that the, the charger is not working and and also the different services related to to the charging process so for for our investigations, we finally uh, try to uh, to divide the, the different requirements for the charging stations in, in basic requirements. What was the basic thing for uh, for the users was this possibility of of be sure that they were going to find a charger when they when they need. So this was a basic requirements requirement, taking in consideration that when you charge the car. Uh, when you charge your electric vehicle, it's not only the car and the pole which is participating or is which is part of the process, but also the the apps uh, that you need an app to control this this charging process to make the booking. And uh, this app can give you information. So uh, you can develop additional services related to to the way uh, you are charging. And for example, you have the possibility of of um, 
being sure that the origin of the energy that you are consuming is green, for example, is something that the users are going to value, but also related services uh, or attached services to, to this charging process that you can find in the different stations. Of course, uh, light electric vehicles were, were, were are also important for, for our research and it's something that we were considering when we are developing this, uh, we are developing the, the proposals of our, our stations, probably something to, to solve. Uh, we were listening this morning that light electric vehicles are a very good solution for cities. They are, well, we think that is true, but they are very dangerous, but there, there are a lot of accidents. And there are some cities, for example, recently we knew that in Paris, uh, probably they are going to, uh, to forbid the, the, the sharing company for these vehicles because it's, it's really, um, they, they are generating a lot of problems. But okay, it's something probably that a new solution, a new mix between bike or I don't know cheaper bikes or more uh, more easy to to buy bikes uh, will will arrive probably. Yeah, they are very interesting, but I think uh, a pen a pen in this year, I think. And gender uses is also uh, important. We have to make this type of consideration because women are, are very uh, are very uh, worried about security, probably, and um, are probably have different mobility patterns to to men because uh, they do different things. So it's something that we should also consider. So there is another aspect that uh, our uh, handbook is covering, the, the, that is the, the business model. So in our project, uh, we develop different uh, uh, business models in one of the uh, um, in one of the work packages, uh, one of, of, of the, our partners developed these different uh, uh, business uh, models for the charging stations in cities. So I think it's a very interesting result uh, because uh, this business model were validated with the, the, the 10 cities or five cities that are participating in, in the project and where we are going to, to, uh, to test the, the, the products of the, uh, of the project. Uh, considering that uh, we can have different business models related to the charging process in, in a city, including this logistic, including this intermodal station, uh, including also the, the charging stations to uh, unexpected uh, events or, or special events. So combining all these, or we related with, our, with the four concepts of our uh, stations that I, I have presented before, or we have seen before in the slide with this table, with these four stations. Uh, we combine them with uh, the charging processes uh, and with the, the different business models. So uh, uh, we had, for example, that intermodal uh, station is, is a, a taxi station, for example, is a logistics station, is uh, a citizen station. So uh, with all the features of, of the business model, we combined uh, employing this canvas, but we thought that this canvas was mm, too dense or too, too much information to present in, in our handbook. So what we, what we did was combining uh, the different boxes of the canvas in, in four boxes, calling the, the business in the left side, the value in the center, the market on the right side, and the, the flow of, of the cash getting into and getting out uh, in, in another box. And yeah, that's what we included in, 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 our, uh, in our handbook. So, yeah, uh, then we follow the same structure to, to present all the all, all these uh, full color sketches that we have prepared for for showing uh, our uh, our station. Uh, this is the first one, the, the model station of the future. So all the all the stations follow the same pattern. We have this um, this sketch, then we have a. Uh, you will see now we, we have a, an sketch presenting the main features. Uh, in, in three different topics. And finally, we have the, the business model. So uh, yeah, you, you can see here uh, uh, at a station where we are combining the public transport with also the, the private transport and, and different modalities of, uh, of transport, including the, also the active transport. So probably this is, a, uh, this is the, the big, I don't know, station that we are thinking where we can combine uh, all the different transport modes from, from the public, from tram, from a uh, car, from uh, taxis, uh, shared cars, and also shared light electric vehicles, combined with additional services in order to give value to, to the charging process of the time you have to spend uh, at the station. 
And yeah, this is the main features related, uh, presented with these three topics I was uh, saying before, the services that we, we think that can be attached to or can be related to this station, what technologies are going to include, what kind of, of chargers, uh, fast chargers, uh, uh, slow chargers, and what are the locations we think that have sense for, for this facility. And you can see here this, uh, uh, this new, um, uh, I don't know this new model of, of business model of of, uh, of graph that we have uh, made to present the business model, but yeah, we think there are. Um, this is a very generic uh, business model with a lot of features, and probably uh, there is no. Is not, we are not going to have any city that's going to implement everything, but right? uh, we think that you the the cities can take ideas from from here from this business model to implement. Uh, the, the stations they need for uh, uh, for their cities. It's a citizen and mobility, it's a logistic hub, it's a, a taxi stop, it's, uh, it's a business model including the, the park uh, and church, it is very interesting also for, for cities. Highway station of the future, not very different you know, what we can find today in a highway, but going deeper in this concept or to plan you, uh, your trip and to have extra services for the time you're going to spend here. Uh, important also uh, probably for for the freight for uh, uh, for the trucks. Uh, again, the same the same structure and these business models that, uh, as I was saying, uh, that, that can give you a lot of ideas or can uh, inspire you to uh, when you are trying to uh, to define uh, a, a facility like this. The, the left charger of the future, think, uh, thinking that this uh, left charger can be like a, a, a kind of also intermodal station, trying to uh, to locate these chargers, uh, to locate these chargers in, in highway uh, or in, in subway stations, sorry, and in bus stations, and uh, also trying to uh, take benefit of the um, of the urban furniture to, to install these photovoltaic panels have the same same information and this urban station of the future thinking in trying to, to take benefit of of facilities that exist today uh, and uh, at the city and and with uh, access control uh, in order to uh, in order users can can church uh, or can access the the parking lots and the churches when they need uh, and also a, a solution for uh, for city logistics so yeah, this is the, um, the the document, the station of the future. As I was saying, we we are not thinking in generating uh, a station that is closed. We are trying to uh, to give different ideas uh, and think that this uh, station, this facility, have been defined considering uh, what users are demanding, uh, what users think that they are going to need when they uh, they have an electric vehicle because they, it's not still the case uh, and they need to charge it uh, in the city so yeah as i was saying you can download the 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 handbook from the website and thank you very much for your attention if you have any question thanks a lot juan and uh, our colleague marion has put the direct link to the handbook also okay. in the chat so if you are interested to to look at it, uh, you can uh, just click in the link over there and you will have access uh, to the full handbook. Thank you very much, uh, Juan. Um, yeah. So we are now uh, a bit um, over time, so um, I would uh, ask uh, uh, one question to each of you, uh, each of the speakers, and then we can uh, move to the um, to the closing remarks. Um, so, unless there are questions from the audience, of course, if uh, if you still want to ask a question from uh, from to our speakers, please feel free to raise your hand or write it in the chat. But so the first question that I would ask uh, uh, Jos. Um, so uh, I'm actually also working on city logistics and uh, we see that uh, many cities are uh, 
uh, struggling with getting their stakeholders, uh, their urban logistics stakeholders on board. Um, so uh, my question to you would be, how did you uh, manage to involve uh, the logistic players uh, and get them on board uh, with the transition? If you can uh, give, uh, I don't know, two or three key uh, suggestion for other cities that would uh, make this uh, stakeholder engagement mm -hmm. specifically for the logistics sector more easy. Okay, yes, gladly, thank you. Um, I think one important reason for, for uh, making sure that the stakeholders are involved was from our uh, governance, the Vice Mayor of Mobility, responsible in 2019 for the decision making. She wanted to be sure that the logistics sector would be uh, OK with the policy to be developed and to be implemented. So that was for a very, let's say, important reason for us to make sure that we strengthened the bonds with the companies, which we already started, by the way, to develop, I think, back in 2013, so 10 years ago. So it's it's result of a long term effort. Of course, things have developed also around us, but uh it takes time and it takes work that's so uh, as i said personal approach uh, if there's a problem you need to really devote time to make sure that you understand this problem and how to address it in policy so we also hired for in this ecostars program this has been active for i think almost also 10 years and we tailored it to our policy needs so now it's instead of uh, it originally, it was an EU project aimed at fuel um, reduction of fuel consumption, and now we have changed the, the reward actually for the, the EcoStars more to how ready is your company and your fleet for uh, zero emission city logistics and efficient city logistics. Both things are now equally important. Uh, so we hire logistic brokers. I mentioned it in my presentation, and they. Uh, are instructed, of course, properly instructed, and then they, they visit individual companies showing interest in support and, uh, and needing in need of knowledge. Or uh, So uh, I would say make sure you have the capacity uh, and to, uh, of course, the support also from your local government. Uh, they, uh, you can assure them that you that they uh, you do for them what, what needs to be done to introduce this policy with let's say the maximum chance of success that's i think the best way to put it uh, because it's still an adventure of course you can imagine it's a big transition thank you very much yes um so for uh, uh Josef, uh, I see there are actually two questions in the uh, in the chat. So the first one is uh, if you are considering uh, biogas as a long term solution for your uh, uh, bus fleet or is the focus really on uh, hydrogen and e-buses? And the second question related to it is, so there is this uh, ban on the sale of uh, heavy duty vehicles, including buses uh, by 2030. Will that be an issue for uh, for Barcelona? OK, thank you very much for the questions. Um, about the first one, about uh, if we focus in in uh, clean technology of course we will focus in hydrogen and and electric ones more than electric than hydrogen but we don't know how we will uh, define it, uh, each one in the next years um what we are trying to do with the cng is not to to to, to buy buses in 2030 is uh to adapt we use this CNG mm. that is neutral in C CO2, but they emit uh, a little NOx and particles. Mm -hmm. But uh, we use this technology to adapt because it's very hard for a bus operator this transformation from diesel to to electric, and we need time. And this is only uh, a time for adaptation. Okay. And on the on the ban uh... on, on the on the ban, no, it's not a problem. Uh, we we are not planning to buy any mm -hmm. uh, CNG buses in 2030. Yeah. 
the, the idea is to use uh, yeah, to retrofit the one uh, existing one. No, no, retrofit. No, to to use the, the same buses. Okay. Use the same buses. No, retrofit. In we use we did a lot of retrofits from diesel to hybrid in the past, but to retrofit in the electrics and hydrogens uh, cost a lot, a lot of money, and we 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 don't know if this is the best uh, the best. Uh, Option, yeah. Is option for for this nowadays. Understood. Thank you very much. And uh, one uh, final question for uh, for Juan. Uh, so you carried out this extensive uh, um, questionnaire asking uh, to adjust basically the the first uh, drafts that you had made. Um, what was uh, the the things that surprised you the most in terms of uh, uh, what were the key elements that? Uh, a station of the future would really need and that I would be interested in seeing what the participants uh, you have highlighted a few of them but uh, maybe you can gi give us an insight on what you found the most surprising uh, you're muted can you hear me now yes there is yeah, a bit of an echo I had, I had a problem I have a problem with uh, I have a problem with my screen and now my screen is um, black and I can't see anything. So I try to to connect with with this mobile phone. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, well, well, what's surprising uh, for us, for example, is the the level of satisfaction of of light uh, of the internal combustion engines and electric vehicles was similar. So uh, what we saw is that the uh, the owners of the electric vehicles are very happy with the cars. Probably they are saying that are going, the next car they are going to buy is going to be an electric uh, uh, electric vehicle. But also the, uh, the internal combustion engines uh, uh, owners are also saying that probably their next car will be uh, electrical. But the, they say they have these problems with the charging. The key for for owning, for example, a light, uh, electric vehicle is having the possibility of charging at home. Uh, and if you if you don't have uh, you don't have the possibility of having a, a charging at your home, probably you're not going to have a, an electric vehicle. And the other things is is uh, how important is for is for for users uh, the, these additional services that uh, that we can uh, provide around the the charging mm -hmm. or of the electric vehicle that is the ensuring the availability uh, controlling the process i have i want to have control of the process i want to know uh, how much time is going is going to take uh, to change my car till the level of of energy i want how i'm going to pay for it so this is also uh, very important the the data that you can uh, that uh, you can change or interchange with the uh, 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 charging points and that mm -hmm. are going give me uh, some additional services and some additional control over the process. Thank you very much. Uh, and with that, I would move to our final remarks. Um, so Michele Tozzi, Deputy Director of the Knowledge and Innovation at UITP, I give you the floor without further ado. Thank you, Arianna, Eugenia, thanks to the Covenant of Mayors for the opportunity to represent UATB in this webinar. I, I noted down several interesting inputs on policies, regulation, on the adoption of the clean solutions in the cities uh, represented by the speakers, on the integration of light electric mobility capacity and resilience of the infrastructure. And I think that this gave us a very wide perspective on the topic of electric mobility. So thank you for that. So since we have very little time left, actually no time left at all, um, I would I would like just to share three of the main trends and three of the main challenges we have been observing in the public transport um, sector uh, when it comes to the transition to um, to um, to zero emissions. So first, um, the constructive policies and regulations um, which are already existing are actually driving the market and cities towards cleaner technology. And this is a reality, uh, for instance, in the bus sector, um, for instance, with the Clean Vehicle Directive or the Directive on the Alternative Fuel Implementations. And I will share only one number on the evolution of clean buses in the next uh, slide. 
There is a very strong leadership of cities in this process, and several European cities have already defined um, targets which are actually more ambitious than the one set by the policy framework. Several European cities have already stopped to purchase uh, diesel vehicles, and they should be able to operate fully electric fleets by 2025 and 2030. And finally, the third point I would like to mention is the new business model and the new actors, which are already mentioned, uh, are already emerging throughout this process. One example, Santiago in Chile, the second country in the world for number of electric buses and where the stakeholder with a traditional energy provider is now strongly involved in the actual deployment of electric buses. So if these are the trends we are already observing, uh, I will leave you with three of the main challenges. Of course, this is a very high level analysis. We know that every time we introduce a new uh, technology, we need a very attentive assessment to fulfill the operational requirements and the final user needs. And this was described very well by a few slides from Joseph TMB. But today there is the need to enlarge the operations of clean uh, fleets. This is already happening with buses, but there is a huge potential in what we could call uh, non-traditional public transport services like on-demand and taxis. On the red side, very quickly, you have uh, quite, I mean, some um, quite uh, recent statistics on the uh, deployment of electric buses in Europe and the evolution of taxi fleets. So just one number for electric buses, you see that in the last three years, 2020 to 2022, the number has doubled. And taxis is actually um, a key sector to reduce the emissions in cities, considering the high number of kilometers traveled. And according to some UTP statistics, which will be published in the next weeks, the number of clean taxis in the, in the, in the period 2019 to 2021 has increased by 15%. And if you look at battery taxes, this increase is more than 60%. So in terms of absolute numbers, we are still, uh, it's still a small number, but uh, the tendency is quite clear. And another element you can see in this graph is that the total number of vehicles um, for the taxi sector has actually decreased uh, because of the pandemic. And this brings us to the second challenge I would like to mention, which is the recovery of the, um, the recovery of the ridership. Now, uh, Joseph mentioned that in Barcelona, the ridership is now about between 90 and 95% of the pre-pandemic situation. But according to some data that UTP has been collecting over the years, on average in Europe, the ridership is about 80% of the, of the numbers pre-pandemic. So some operators find ourselves in a situation of reduced revenue, adaptations to the new demand and the need to renew the fleet and include cleaner technology, which implies high investment cost. And the very final point is on renewable energy. We should keep in mind that decarbonizing public transport is not only about energy consumption, it's beyond energy consumption, and that the old supply chain needs to be sustainable from raw materials to the life uh, to the end of life of the vehicles and technology we uh, produce. And in order to maximize the effect of what we are doing in the sector, we need to combine the shift to cleaner technology with the adoption and the supply of renewable energy. So this is the way to reach net zero. So thank you, Arianna. This is what I want to share in five minutes, maybe less. Thanks a lot, Michele. Um, so with that, I would move back to Eugenia for uh, a couple of final slides. One slide, let's see. Yeah, 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 of course. No, thank you very much. We are already late, but I, I wanted to, to thank, of course, uh, Michele, then Toma, Pedro, Jos, Josep and Juan for being with us today and for sharing uh, all these insights and, and your own experiences and, and to our participants, of course, for uh, sticking with us. 
uh, for this hour and a half. You will receive the presentations and the link to the recording, of course. Uh, do not hesitate to contact us anytime. Uh, here I put our uh, two email addresses. And then um, we also hope to see you in the last webinar of our series that will be about SAMS, Sustainable Urban Mobility Plans, and CCAPS, Sustainable Energy and Climate Action Plans Integration. And thanks again, again, also to our partners in the Coalition of the Willing and this uh, webinar, Polis and UITP, uh, for being uh, active Covenant supporters together with, uh, with EuroCities and many, many others. Uh, thank you very much to all of you and have a, a lovely day. Thank you, everybody. Bye. Thank you, bye. 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 bye.